my older sibling and I were staying at home, inside a small town in Ohio with fewer people inside it than my mom's graduating class of the city that we came from. My sibling is grounded. Both the house phone and their own phone are locked in my dad's gun safe, which neither of us had the combination to. The reason for being grounded is something silly and arbitrary. I can't exactly remember why. Our grandparents live down the street. Our great-grandmother lives in a small house they built on that property, so she could be independent and they would still be close by. Our parents told us they were going to go check on my great-grandma, as our grandparents were out of town that day. They told us when they got back, we would order pizza. That sounded good to seven-year-old me and to my 15-year-old sibling, who I'll call Emily. We played video games for a little while, and we both started to get hungry, quickly wondering when our parents would be back. I'd say after around two hours of them being gone, we heard a knock at the door. I went downstairs, pretty excited for the food. My sibling followed close behind. I walked up to the door, which had this large window in it, and it's not our parents. It's a very tall, lean, white guy and some short black hair and scruffy facial hair. I'd say maybe 24 or 25 years old. It's pretty jarring because everybody knew everybody in this small town and we had no clue who this was. I held up my finger like one second to him and then closed the curtain. I turned to see Emily staring at the door in a bit of disbelief because she'd seen that person too. A few seconds later, that knocking turned into pounding, then turned into shaking and rattling of our doorknob. We're both now terrified with no way to call our parents. Emily grabbed my hand and ran me into the kitchen. She grabbed a knife and I distinctly remember it breaking in her hand. It broke as in the little blade fell like right out of the handle. Back then, for whatever reason, our kitchen was just ramshackle. Lots of rusted utensils. Things were jimmy rigged together. And of course, all kinds of stuff broken or breaking. Regardless, we both hid inside the laundry room and just held each other, still hearing that banging and pounding on the door. It went on for about five minutes, which felt like hours. Then we heard the front door open. One thing that I will say about my sibling is she's always been ready to protect me at a moment's notice. They were ready to jump up with that shitty knife and defend me that moment the dude was upon us. Instead, it was my mom rounding the corner, holding up two pizza boxes, and wondering why her two kids were in this crumpled up heap of tears on the floor. We both stood up and ran to tell her about that man outside, but we were met with laughter. My dad was outside talking to him. She said he was asking about buying a broken down car that had been in her driveway for a few months. He was apparently a mechanic. My mom felt terrible, but found the situation a bit amusing. Apparently, she went out and told the man, and he said he felt bad for scaring us. We were given hugs and promised the phones wouldn't be locked away when they were gone again. Spent the rest of the evening eating pizza with choked up sobs. Something still bothers me, even though it didn't as a kid, and it's something that I just never thought about. Why would a grown man pound on the door like that, shake the handle, try his very damnedest to get into a house, whether the parents were home or... The youngest child had held up their finger like one second to go get their parent. Why would someone want to talk about a car that didn't have any sort of for sale sign on it, especially at 9 or 10 p.m. at night? It's kind of scary that my parents just brushed it off so lightly, but something in my gut, especially being an adult now, just told me that that's not the way adults, at least normal adults, act. The guy's name ended up being Chris. He came by the house a few more times that week to inspect that car. The first time he came by, our parents were home. He got the hood up and went underneath it, checked out pretty much everything from what I can remember. Everything was, I guess, friendly that first visit, except sometimes I would notice him looking over at me and Emily, giving us this weird, creepy smile. He came over a few days later, that same week. But the next time was at an odd time again and our parents weren't home. Now that we knew this guy, Emily opened up the door for him. Hey, sorry to bother you, Chris started. It's no problem, but our parents aren't here. You'll have to come back tomorrow, she explained. Oh, it's not a big deal. 
I wanted to check out the tires and wheel wells real quick. It won't take long. Emily gave him the okay then closed the door. We watched him from the living room window as he went back to his own car, this crappy old thing, and rummaged around, then went over to the car that he wanted to buy. He did proceed to do exactly what he said he was going to do, and after a few minutes, we kind of got bored. We almost left the window, went back to whatever we were doing, but he did something weird that immediately caught our attention. He turned and walked right at the house, snapping photos of the exterior. He got the sides, the front, the second story, and he almost went into the backyard. That's when he noticed us staring wide-eyed through the main window. He put the camera away and waved, then pointed at the front door as if to suggest to meet him there. Emily went over and told me to stay by the phone. If anything happened, she told me to call 911 and then dad. This was back in the day where everybody had landlines, so... Even being in first or second grade at the time, I had all my close friends and our parents' numbers memorized. It was just part of being social back then. They talked for a minute before Emily closed the door again and came back. She was white like a sheet of paper. She looked hollow, gone, totally unlike herself. I asked her what happened and if I should call and she shook her head no. To this day, I still don't know what Chris said to Emily. She's always been private about it, but it definitely gave me the heebie-jeebies for years after the fact, especially with my imagination going wild with all manner of theories. She said something to our parents once they got home. I remember my dad going to his office to call Chris. He went in angry, all big and heavy-footed. We could hear his stern voice through the door, but eventually it softened up. He hung up and came back out. He explained it was some sort of misunderstanding, much like that first experience that we had with him. But he was taking pictures of the house, I said. My dad quickly gave me this funny look. He what? He took photos of the house with one of those paper cameras. Emily immediately backed me up. Paper cameras? My dad asked for clarification. Like a disposable camera? With the wrap around cardboard on it? My mom asked my sister. Yeah, like that. She almost screamed. It felt like we were actually getting somewhere now. Well, my dad said. I'm sure there's some kind of explanation, but I'm not calling him back now. I'll just talk to him later. That was that. We were ushered off as kids that didn't know better and just told to go to bed. I remember just lying there in the dark for most of my night staring at the window, wondering if I'd see a flash come through the blinds. Why the hell would he come by and take pictures of our house? Emily said something like it was probably so he could break in. He'd have an outside layout of all the entrance and exits. And I guess in my kid brain that made sense, but it really, really freaked me out. The next time Chris came by was the following Monday. I was actually home alone. We'd gotten out of school around the same time rode the bus home like normal, but when Emily and I got dropped off, she unlocked the door for me and walked a couple of streets over to her friend's house. It wasn't super uncommon for her to leave me alone for 30 or 40 minutes, at which point she'd run back over, get in the house right before our parents got home from work. It was harmless. I didn't mind being home alone because I got to watch whatever I wanted, have some snacks, all that good stuff. Well. Not five minutes after sitting on the couch with my juice box and gummies, there's a knock at the door. I froze in place and willed myself to actually disappear into the cushions. I remember trying hard not to actually wet my pants. You gotta remember I was six, maybe seven at the time. It shouldn't have been unsupervised. Fortunately, I knew better than to answer the door. So I did the only thing that made sense and pretended that nobody was home. Whoever it was would move on shortly, right? Except they didn't. There was that pestersome knock that turned into a banging. I'll be damned if it wasn't familiar. It was that same aggressive knock from our first encounter with the man. I knew something was wrong and I knew it was him. So I didn't even bother to go to a window. I just continued to sit on the couch until finally, to my relief, it stopped. 
I'd been staring at the clock on the radio for nine minutes, and it ticked by while he banged on the door. Even longer than that first time. Chris was truly unhinged with that. He didn't go away, though. I watched in horror as I saw him creep around the far side of the house, checking the dining room window, the biggest one that he could get to. I remember my throat nearly swelling shut from anxiety as I heard it slide open. I felt the warm air blow in from the yard. He leaned in and peered into the living room. We locked eyes. He brought a single hand up and then waved at me like he was a puppet or something. Then he gave me this horrific smile. Hey, he started. I didn't say anything. Mom and dad home? He asked. Still nothing from me. Yeah, I didn't think so. He crawled the rest of the way through the window frame. Still, even with him in the house, I couldn't move. To this day, it was the most fear-inducing experience of my life. I couldn't see what he was doing as he moved through the house, somewhere down the hall on the other side of the dining room. The only things down there were Emily's bedroom and my parents' bedroom, and the front door to the outside, before eventually circling back to me in the living room. He never came back down the hall, so wherever he went was in one of those rooms. Eventually, he comes back out, waves at me, says goodbye, and then slips back through the window. I'll never forget seeing his arms snake back through that opening and pull the shade closed behind him. Truly nerve-wracking, just covering his tracks right behind him in front of me. He knew I was just a kid, that it was possible nobody would believe me, and I think he was counting on that. Eventually, my sister gets home and finds me in hysterics on the sofa. I started shaking after he left from the fear, spilled my juice box on the couch, which sent me spiraling even further, thinking I was now going to get in even more trouble. Anyway, I told her what happened, or tried to. I watched her face twist into worry, and then she finally understood what I was saying. Chris came, banged on the door, before just letting himself into the house. Did he touch you? She asked. I shook my head no. Emily nodded and ran to the phone. Called my dad, and before I knew it, both parents were spilling in the front door. They questioned me pretty thoroughly, assured me that you staying on the couch was not a big deal. All they wanted to know was what happened with Chris. Finally, I told them what I could and where he went in the house. Which window? My dad asked. I pointed to the one in the dining room. Okay, and then where'd he go? Down the hall, I said. Okay, and then what? I shook my head and started crying again. My folks and Emily all shared a look and then they quietly agreed to go check their bedrooms. They understood he must have gone in one of them. A few minutes later, I heard Emily make this weird sound, like a yelp. Our parents quickly rushed in. In the moment, I really wasn't sure what they found, but later, it was all kinds of weird stuff of hers that went missing. Panties, a hairbrush, pictures from her corkboard. Super creepy and stalker stuff. My dad called Chris nonstop for the next 24 hours, never got him to answer. He never came by for the car, he never paid us, he never picked it up. The whole thing was a ruse just to get close to us girls. Chris would end up being arrested years later, by the time I was in high school. We all had that moment of what the fuck, and we saw his photo in the paper. It turned out that Chris wasn't even his real name, and he certainly wasn't a mechanic. He was a career peeping Tom and a sexual assailant, known for targeting families. I consider us super fortunate to get off the hook when we did. Knowing I was alone in the house with somebody that was so violent, creepy, and unpredictable is just a sickening thought, and everyone in my family shares it. His history of crimes and abuse is appalling, and it only seemed to escalate after our initial encounter with him. As for our incident, my parents called the police and filed the report, but never saw him again. Not until that mugshot in the article like 10 years later. I remember my dad would periodically call the number Chris gave us, just to see if anybody would answer. He did that for years. Part of me wonders what he would have said. Chris would have picked up. I 
went to a college in a small town called Sheridan up in Wyoming. I moved there in the fall of 2009, just after one of the worst crime sprees rocked the entire community from top to bottom. The crazy part of it all is I actually moved into a house just two doors down from where this happened. I was living with my grandparents at the time and they were really shaken up. I remember my grandpa just sitting awake at his desk until 2 or 3 a.m. every night, glass of whiskey in one hand and a gun near the other. He's a Vietnam vet, takes security very seriously. After that crime wave, he just went back to his survival instincts. I was new to the community when all the information was rolling out, so it was a little hard to follow. I'll give you the breakdown the way that I understood it all. There were three boys in Sheridan that ran together and were known for causing trouble, petty criminal behavior. Their names were Wyatt, Darmy, and Dennis, who was the oldest at 18 at the time. To me, these names meant nothing, but for the people of Sheridan, they were well known and usually the first to be fingered for a lot of the basic crime that happened around town. From what I gathered, it sounded like these three had been on a bit of a tear in regard to shenanigans created so much whirlwind destruction that they had it in their heads they needed to get out of town. This was all in their heads as they were teenagers, 15, 16, and 18. Nothing they were doing was actually really that bad. Still, they convinced themselves they were career criminals and about to go on the run. So they start allocating the stuff that they thought they would need, namely money. A series of overnight robberies landed them with a small pile of cash a few items of value, and a handgun. Wyatt procured the weapon from a car that he'd broken into and handed it over to the group. From there, they felt like they'd reached it big time. They could start robbing people for real now. I believe it was within the same 72 hours of stealing the gun. They broke into the Ernest house in the middle of the night with the intent to take everything of value. They weren't expecting to find Bob and his wife asleep in bed, but they were prepared for it now strapped with a handgun. They ordered Bob and his wife on the ground, but Bob did not like that. He rolled right out of bed and approached the boys, telling them to get out of the house. One of the boys pulled the trigger without hesitation. Bob took the bullet to the chest and died right there on the floor of his own bedroom. His wife stayed in bed and just watched the whole thing happen, which easily was the most tragic part of the story. The boys immediately realized they fucked up. They just discharged a firearm in the middle of the night in a township with less than 14,000 residents. They could have just left town that night and they would have never been arrested. With their rap sheets, there wasn't a scenario where they escaped now. The reality was they didn't have a means of travel, so it was essentially hiding out around town until their inevitable discovery. All three boys were rounded up within 24 hours. The investigation was cut and dry. They were given life sentences, or at least that's what I heard. Rumor was the life sentence got overturned for the two that didn't pull the trigger, but I personally never looked into it. I can't say that my time there was tarnished by the event. The community was still beautiful, still had little great social pockets, but I can't say that I wasn't affected. Sheridan is a tiny little town, a place where murder just doesn't happen very often. Being a new face around town, I could tell when old timers were cautious around me. There was a shadow over the longtime locals, one of suspicious and unknown fear, true paranoia. Like I mentioned earlier, my grandpa would walk the house every night, check the windows until the sun came up some nights. The neighbors were reserved, elderly folk around town the same, but the college was even stiffer. All the staff were a little uptight, worrisome, the students kind of the same. The student body was big for being such a small town because many of them were transplants from other areas, like myself. We were all shocked to hear about something so heinous going down just a couple of streets over. It made us look at other students with caution, like anybody could be a thief or a murderer. I remember that first semester being some of the most uptight energy I've ever felt, not just at school, but everywhere in town. Rest in peace, Bob. I actually went to high school with Wyatt, Darmy, and Dennis. I won't say that they were nice guys or anything, but when I heard what they did, I was shocked. I mean, these were the kind of kids that shot spitwads in class, 
made loud noises to distract the teacher. It was hard to imagine them breaking into somebody's house and murdering them. We were all in shock that next morning, especially when all the details came rolling out. They stole a gun, entered a house, forced themselves on a sleeping elderly couple. It was like we were discussing details from a case from Los Angeles or New York City. What we were talking about just didn't happen in Sheridan, and yet it did. And some of my classmates were responsible. I remember Darmy being funny, almost like the class clown type of kid. He had jokes and always wore a smile across his face. He was the type of kid you actually watch in the hallway just to see what he would do. He came from a good family. I think they did pretty well financially, so to hear about him getting caught up with Dennis and his crime spree was heartbreaking. He was the last one I ever would have guessed to be involved. But just like everybody else had said, something about the energy of those three boys. They encouraged each other in a way that made it seem like they could do anything and never get caught. Poor Wyatt. The thing that I remember most about him is that he loved the outdoors. He liked camping, fishing, all that kind of stuff. But what he really loved was the rodeo. If he had more access to outlets and preferences, maybe he would have never gotten involved to the extent in which he did. And of all three of them, he seemed to have the healthiest lifestyle, actually had his own hobbies and interests outside of causing trouble. To think he threw it all away just for an evening of what he thought would be fun, it's just crazy to think about now. Dennis, he's the only one that doesn't surprise me. He had quite a rap sheet, but aside from that, he seemed to thoroughly enjoy creating chaos. He did school, he stole from stores and people's houses. Sad to say, but he was probably always going to be going down the road of imprisonment. He had a history of being a hothead, fighting, making threats. There were even rumors about him hurting animals. Being kids, we did the only thing we could and just avoided him. It's sick, I know, but I'm grateful it wasn't any worse than that night. My friends and I had nightmares the rest of the school year about that group of boys breaking into our own homes, killing our parents in the same exact manner. And I guess it really wasn't totally out of the question. A boy like Dennis, he had enemies. Kids at school he didn't outright like, and all it would have taken was just one little suggestion. He might have broken into a different house that night. Maybe even my house. As hard as it is to think about, I was there the night that Robert was killed. I lived next door to the Ernest for years and years. Would have never thought that something like this could happen to Bob. There's no warning, no lead up to the strange events or confrontations, nothing. And that honestly, to me, is the scariest part. This one really hits hard because of the outright randomness of the act itself. These boys just picked a house that looked dark and empty and even wealthy and just fully committed to the robbery. It was well after dark, but I don't remember the exact time. I was actually asleep when I started hearing something weird outside. Walking, talking, voices. I could tell they were trying to be hushed, but weren't doing a very good job. This actually put me at ease that night. I figured it was just somebody getting home late. Surely somebody committing a crime would take much more caution and be quiet in their actions. Whatever the case, they made a few laps to the Ernest home before slipping through a window. I believe one of the ground floor slats to the basement was it. A lot of the homes around here have basements. The windows are pretty easily forced in with enough pressure. Ours had previously blown out with a hard enough windstorm. Well, being half asleep inside my own house, I figured whoever it was had gotten to their own home. I didn't think they'd slipped in through a window. It was quiet after that. I almost fell asleep until the yelling started. Suddenly there was commotion next door. I had no idea what was going on. I thought maybe a fire or some other kind of emergency until I realized I was hearing lots of different voices, none of which I recognized. Don't move. Stay in the bed or you'll get hurt. Don't fucking move. Tell us where the jewelry is. Tell us the code to the safe. This, as well as other manner of threats, were being screamed at the top of their lungs. It felt like a lifetime that I listened to it all, but in reality, it was probably just 90 seconds. The hollering went back and forth, most of it just being outright demands. 
Then I heard a bit of a scuffle. At this point, I was getting out of bed, thinking about reaching for the phone when I heard it. The unmistakable blast of a gun being discharged. I remember immediately hitting the floor, thinking bullets might stray through the walls and pass through my own home. We were close enough that it was a real possibility, as the light from the gun blast flashed through the windows. I crawled to the phone and dialed 911. I found the line busy. Everybody on the street was apparently calling the police as well. This was a good thing, as whatever I chalked it up to a late night neighborly excursion was obviously something much more dangerous. I dialed again, had the same result, so I just waited. This was a huge mistake, as the things I heard are still with me to this day. I could hear Bob going through the motions of death, even a whole house away. A thud, a grunt, another thud, then haggard breathing and gurgling. It's horrendous. This was a guy I knew very well, a pillar of our own community. Couldn't imagine what could have led somebody to kill him. Then I could hear his wife, sobbing, screaming, pleading for help, probably also trying to call the police. You could also hear the killers, whoever they were, panicking and running desperately around the house, knocking stuff over, scrambling for valuables, before ultimately spilling out through the front and back doors and bolting in different directions. I sat there in a panic and waited to see if anybody would break into my own house. It might be a natural hiding place after such a crazy crime. Fortunately, nobody tried my doors or windows, but I figured they were just trying to run and not hide. Next thing I knew, my house was being lit up with red and blue sirens, cruiser after cruiser pulling into the earnest driveway. An ambulance, EMT crews, even the medical truck from the fire department rolled up. Again, this is a very small town. Something so out of character for us was a full-scale call to action. Everybody wanted to be on scene, make themselves available after such an evil act. The boys didn't get far. Hell, Bob's wife knew a couple of them by name. They were rounded up by night or in the morning without incident, booked and then justice was served. They all made many attempts to overturn those lifetime sentences that they received, to which the Supreme Court denied. As for the rest of us, the town was not the same after it, at least not for a few years. We are like Mayberry before the murder. Some of us literally didn't lock our doors to our homes, cars, or anything. We just didn't have that kind of criminal here. Since that killing, times have changed. We actually had a few more since. People seem to react less and less now. The younger generation just aren't as phased, don't seem to care what happens in their own community as long as it doesn't happen to them directly. A very strange way of thinking, one that I don't understand, but hey, I'm an old timer. What do I know? I've been retired from the police force for nearly a decade, but I was on duty the night those boys killed Robert. It was a truly tragic incident, almost an accident, honestly. Those boys were stupid, wild, and up to no good. But I can't say that any of them have the heart of a murderer. I think one thing led to another, one bad decision after the next, and soon they were just in too deep. And to this day, I've never gotten a call like the one I did that night. We got radioed for the Ernest House just like everybody else that night. I worked for the local precinct, not the county sheriff's department, so I was one of the first to get there. The street was lit up from all the neighbors coming outside, half of them armed themselves, standing alone on the street, waiting to hear what was going on. We taped off the property and let everybody know to stay back and put their guns up. Sheridan Police Department has it covered. First thing was securing the scene and getting poor Linda out of there. His wife was in absolute hysterics, and Robert was actually still alive. Just as we got the scene cleared and everything taped off, EMTs arrived, got the victim loaded up and transported to the hospital. Unfortunately, he died there that night. The gunshot wound was just too much for him at close proximity. Bob was an old guy, a military vet, so it was just tragic for us to see a guy like that from our community get gunned down in his own home. Linda gave us the name of one of the boys and it was just downhill after that. The second that she said Dennis, 
I knew he'd only have certain individuals with him during such a high energy crime. Like I said earlier, these kids were dealt with a lot, but we never saw anything like this coming. Dennis grew up with a history of poor behavior. Getting in fights at school was a big problem. We caught him vandalizing stuff before, as well as a lot of theft and burglary. That being said, all the times we busted his ass, he was under 18, so couldn't really do anything and not much happened. His family didn't discipline him in a way that mattered. So Dennis just kept having this latchkey lifestyle right up until turning 18. At that point, I think he knew the reality of the situation had changed for him. And because of that, he decided to up the caliber of the crimes. And that was a shame because none of the kids were that cutthroat of their own. Something about them being together just made them constantly up the ante. In fact, while they were solo on their own, they were actually pretty good kids. Great senses of humor, good work ethic. But the second they all got in the same room, it just turned into hijinks, chaos, dishonesty, and trouble. Unfortunately, Robert and the rest of the Ernest family had to pay the sacrifice for those boys to understand the weight of their own reality. We scrambled that night and had them all by morning. Two of them just went home, Darmy and Wyatt both. They were easy to locate and folded under the pressure of questioning almost right away. The story very quickly started to come together. Dennis had somehow convinced the other two that they were some kind of street gang. And they needed to allocate their means of getting out of Sheridan. This is a common thinking up here for our delinquent youth. There's a couple private school facilities for troubled kids. Many of them have that same outlook. Sheridan is just a place for kids to escape. The scary part is, is that our township is very isolated, tucked along the Montana border. So the options for these kids are pretty minimal. Most of them end up stealing cars or wandering off into the wilderness. And if it's winter time, temperatures can easily plummet to what most would consider fatal. Many truck drivers up here report seeing kids trying to hitchhike down the roadways in and out of towns. Usually one escapee or criminal trying to get to the next town. It's a very weird problem to deal with living in such a rural community, but it's better than having a bunch of tweakers and junkies around, I suppose. So that's where it all started. Dennis convincing the other boys it's time to skip town, become real life criminals. Darmy and Dennis start stealing cash from all over town, literally any place they can find money or valuables. Wyatt had a different idea. Knowing this is the quaint little town that we all know and love, he starts checking door handles, knowing that he'd find a number of them to be unlocked. It only took him a couple of tries and soon, he had his own little wad of cash as well as a fully loaded firearm. When he brought it to Dennis, it changed the entire perception of these kids. They were in it now. Finding that gun was a whole new avenue of options for these kids. Like I said, we might be the capital of runaways for the entire country. Very few of them, perhaps none, had ever had the idea to secure a firearm before hitting the road. Nothing would secure a ride faster. Could you imagine stopping for three boys, hitchhiking in the cold? only for one of them to pull a gun on you, tell you to drive until the tank was empty. Spooky because that's where they were headed. But it never got to that point. Dennis fucked that up for them before they ever got a chance. He dropped the gun after pulling the trigger and fled like the others. We knew he wasn't armed, or at least hoped he wasn't, as we combed all of town for him that night and the following morning. He knew going home wasn't a smart move, so we hopped from one friend's house to another, doing his best to avoid all the usual places he might be. One tip came from one local walking their dog in the park that morning. They said that they spotted Dennis cutting through the area. We swarmed the whole park, but he vanished. Those kids that wander at night know every little avenue of escape. Still, it wasn't even an hour later we had him cornered between a nearby neighborhood and some businesses. He surrendered agreed to come with us and proceeded to dodge every question we threw at him. Once we explained that we already had Wyatt and Darmy in custody, they'd flipped and ratted him out. Then he started to talk. Did his best to try to pin it on the other kids too. It didn't work though. Wyatt had carefully laid everything out for us, even admitted to finding the gun and handing it over. We even had Dennis's fingerprints on the gun, as well as Linda Ernest witness testimony. 
All three boys received life sentences, but Darmy and Wyatt later had their sentence adjustment, 25 years for the killing and 10 years for the break-in, total of 35 years behind bars. They'll be 50 when they get out, and many of the locals around here didn't care to hear about the lighter sentence. Bob was a local businessman in town. He had the respect of just about everybody you can think of. The craziest part of it all to me is that it happened 15 years ago. I've been retired for a while now, but for many of us long-timers, that murder still feels like it happened last night. Hell, to this day, nothing like that has ever happened again. There may have been two clear-cut killings since then, but they were both like parking lot disputes, or both parties were aggressive until somebody went too far. No one has been gunned down in their own home since Bob. If we hadn't arrested them as quickly as we did, who knows what that body count could have actually been. I moved to New York City with the same crazy aspirations as many others did. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I had this general idea. I've always felt like a creative person, so I envisioned myself working on sets or running errands for a production company. I couldn't even get an interview with the few companies that I found in the phone book. I ran out of money, started to slip into that lower class lifestyle that was waiting for me. I realized I had to find something fast. I took the first job that would have me, got hired at a pound, something like an animal shelter, where I washed dogs and sprayed out kennels for eight hours a day. It was miserable. I hated every second of it, as they weren't friendly animals. They were kind of scrappy fighters picked up from the streets of New York City. Every shift was this battle of supremacy inside this animal shelter. Getting nipped, bit, pissed on was just part of the gig. The other issue was that I smelled like wet dogs pretty much all the time. It made it hard to book interviews after my shift, as I always had to run home, shower, and then change. By then, all the offices that I was trying to get to were closed. Honestly, it was just a lose-lose situation on both ends for me. Some time went by and I just wasn't adjusting well. Keep in mind, I was 22 years old at the time. I think this was back in the early 2000s. So, unfortunately for me, my living conditions created a situation wherein I started drinking every day. I had a few friends that I met from bars and my place of work, as well as neighbors in the building. It wasn't uncommon for us all to get shit-faced on our days off, blast music, and play beer pong. We were all broke as fuck, but we got together. We would always scrape some cash together just to party. This wasn't what I moved to New York for, so it dried up pretty quickly, especially since we were all tight when it came to budgeting and having our bills paid. As I drank more, I started showing up late for work, started performing poorly and complaining. Then a couple of weeks, I got shit canned. Par for the course in the city because there's a line of people waiting to replace you. I think I got fired in October, just had just enough money to scrape by for another month, maybe two. I remember hitting rock bottom that winter, the one that left me shivering in the darkness of my own making. I was already living in a real slum, a truly scary place, and I couldn't wake up from the nightmare. Struggling to make ends meet, working as much as possible just to keep a roof over my head, but it never seemed like it was enough. The city was this cruel mistress, always demanding more always taking everything I had, without ever so much as giving me another opportunity. That's just the way of life in these busy metros. If you aren't already established or at least have your ducks in a row financially, the city itself will swallow you. It happens to folks every day, falling by the wayside. And I'm not even talking about the COVID times. New York City has been hard living for a century, and I'll bet the bank on that. That being said, moving there was my choice. And now, my mistake too. I should have never moved to such a fast-paced, high-economy city with nothing but daydreams inside my pocket. 
As you can imagine, I was evicted from my apartment, a dingy little hole in the wall that I'd called home for a few months. The landlord did not care that I was struggling, that I was doing everything I could to pay the rent, just wanted me out. He wanted my stuff gone too. I was left with nothing, no place to go and no one to turn to. The anxiety was suffocating. The anxiety was suffocating. The fear of being alone and vulnerable in a city that did not care. It was a fear that I'd never dealt with before, honestly. Once I ran out of money, all the people that I called friends quit fucking with me. Wouldn't even answer a call or an email. But I guess it's not like I had a phone for much longer after getting served those eviction papers. It was scary because someone could come along at any moment. Police probably. Literally forced me out of the apartment that I was in. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Just biding my time. Looking for any kind of option to get the rent paid. The other thing was all my stuff. If someone came to actually get me out, I wasn't prepared to leave. All my shit would just be tossed out on the street. The vultures that were my neighbors would steal it all before I could even save an arm load. I realized that I would lose everything if I didn't start making a move of some kind. I scraped together what little cash I had. I'd say maybe 200 bucks from that job at the animal shelter. On top of that, I had some various items that had value. I lowballed them just to secure the funds. Stuff like a metal detector, an electric drum kit, literally the most random stuff you can imagine. Either way, it got my savings up to over a thousand dollars. It was enough to get me into a new place, a studio apartment that was a step below the one that I just lost. I didn't even walk the place, just called and reserved it, said I would have the cash on hand in the moment, and walked in. The guy on the phone liked that, so I knew I was getting ready to live in a serious dump. I imagine the place was in disrepair. Maybe you even have leaks, faulty pipes help. Some of these old New York buildings are known for black mold, asbestos, and even gas leaks. But the fear of transporting my belongings alone through the inner city was almost too much to bear. Way worse than all the shit that I just mentioned. I was the target, a vulnerable soul carrying boxes of stuff through the streets, just begging to be robbed or worse. It's New York, baby. Worse shit happens every day. And being an out-of-towner, I bought into all the myths about violence on the streets. What options did I really have, though? Just made sure to do it during the day so normal people would be out, too. I made the move the next day, my heart racing with every step, my eyes scanning the crowds for any sign of danger. There were shady characters lurking in the shadows, sizing me up, wondering if I was worth the trouble. But nobody robbed me. Nobody attacked me. It took me around five or six trips, and anything that was really heavy was unnecessary, and I just left it behind. Carried my mattress down the street was one of the most embarrassing things to ever happen to me, but hey, I needed a place to sleep. I make it to my new apartment, a dingy little studio that smelled of mold and despair. It was home for now. The place was beyond disgusting. When I turned the sink on for the first time, I literally flushed a family of roaches out of the pipes. Beer was my solace, my comfort in the darkness. I spent the afternoon just lounging on the couch, watching TV and drinking alone. The apartment was loud. The sounds of the city bled right through those thin walls like a diseased heartbeat, but I didn't care. I was too busy drowning my sorrows in that sweet golden nectar of beer. It wasn't until I cracked open the last one that I remembered the fridge full of goodies. A six pack of beer, some Chinese food, and who knows what else. I kept the key, planning to return it in the morning, but, but I wanted it all and I wanted it now. The walk back to my old apartment was this gauntlet of shadows and fear. The darkness almost seemed to writhe around me, like a living thing. The street lights casting these long, ominous fingers across the sidewalk. I pressed on driven by my thirst for beer and my own stupidity. I make it back to my old apartment unharmed, slide the key into the lock with that satisfying click, stepped inside, my eyes quickly adjusting to the darkness. The air was thick with the scent of decay and rot, the remnants of my old life just lingering like a ghost. There was even unclean vomit in one corner, piles of empty beer cans, evidence of a true dirtbag. 
I found what I was looking for, the beer and Chinese food, and did my final walkthrough with my footsteps echoing off the walls. I turned up with nothing else, no hidden treasures or forgotten memories, just the echoes of my own footsteps, haunting me like a specter. Part of me was honestly hoping to find a forgotten paycheck or maybe even an envelope with a birthday card and a crumpled up $20 bill in the folds. Nada, just that stuff in the fridge. I left my key on the kitchen counter, a symbol of my complete abandonment, and then locked the front door behind me. The night air was cool and crisp, a welcome feeling from the stifling darkness of the apartment. Cracked open a beer on the walk home, with the sound of the tab popping like a tiny explosion in the stillness of the night. I was completely oblivious, just lost in my own little world of beer and darkness. And this is where I believe it all started to go down. I wandered the last stretch to my building, which was an absolute dump smushed between two larger condo complexes. The windows were barred on many of the ground units, as well as the main door to the building, which was this rattly little piece of shit anyway. There was a punch code to let residents in, as well as a key, to provide some meager security over the employing doorman. I struggled to unlock the door. My hands were full of beer and Chinese food. I finally managed to squeeze inside, but my relief was short-lived. The floor was slick with some kind of liquid, and I didn't notice until it was too late. I slipped and fell, my body crashing to the ground with a sickening thud. I just laid there for a minute, dazed and disoriented. My hip, my back, and my knee were all screaming in agony. At first, I waited for somebody to come and help me, but nobody ever did. I realized this was a new building, a lower class building, and banging around was pretty common around here, so I was on my own. Panic began to set in as I realized I could be laying here for hours, alone and injured. The floor smelled like rancid, like rat shit and human piss. It was the only place that I could lay. As I lay there, I felt my knee and ankle swelling up, the muscles constricting with pain. I knew I had to get up, but I couldn't move. I was trapped, helpless, and alone. Then I saw it, the front door still partially open, stopped by one of the Chinese food boxes. I realized I could potentially get somebody's attention from the street if they happened to walk by. It's pretty late at this point though, closing in on midnight, so my chances of somebody walking by or walking through the building were a lot lower than normal especially in the dangerous neighborhood that I was in. But when I looked up at the door, I saw a shadowy figure grab it from the outside and pull it open. My heart skipped a beat for a moment as I felt a rush of fear. Who was this person? Why were they coming in? I tried to speak, but my voice was barely even whispering. Maybe they saw me fall or just noticed me on the ground and were coming to offer some assistance. It was the best case scenario and one that I was desperately hoping for. I smiled and said hello as the best I could and started to explain what happened to me in slurring and drunken stupor. The figure loomed over me, his features obscured by darkness. Clearly this person didn't have any good intentions. I tried to scramble to my feet but my injured body just wouldn't cooperate. I was trapped at the complete mercy of this stranger. And then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure fell on me. I fought back at first, but the guy grabbed my head with both hands, then slammed it into the floor. Nothing but stars after that. He rummaged through my pockets, took my shoes off, checked every little nook and cranny that might have something to offer. And get this, he even took my beer. As I lay there getting rifled through and robbed, I realized this was probably just some random homeless dude going through the area, and no call to the police would really yield a result. Either way, I just did my best to fight back, but in the state I was in, I couldn't even give him trouble. He emptied my pockets out and took everything, then disappeared back through that door. He didn't assault me anymore besides that initial headbanging, but he was filthy, smelly. The whole encounter was seriously grossing me out. I ended up having to lay there for another hour until one of my new neighbors had gotten off work, discovered me just lying there in the lobby. She 
called the cops, but that was it. She left me out there too. After learning, I was mostly okay. The whole thing was a terrifying experience, one that opened up my eyes to a lifestyle in the heart of a big city. I got myself together and saved some money. Ended up moving out of state not much later after this. Being robbed while I was incapacitated on the floor was a thing that I needed to happen to me, to give me this real perspective on life. You live alone, even in one of the most populated metros in the world. Anything can happen to you. I live in LA, in the suburbs. It's a pretty nice neighborhood. Most of our neighbors are pretty wealthy, but it's still not unusual to hear those ghetto birds late at night. On the night the story takes place, an airship was right over our house. The spotlight kept shining back and forth. I had my wife and toddler son asleep in the room with me. Neither of them had woken up. I thought it might be best to pull out my shotgun out of the safe and get her loaded up, just to be sure. I grabbed my Remington pump and just loaded it up with double lot buck and slug. Went out to the living room and locked the bedroom door behind me. Yes, we have a house lock on the bedroom door. I turned off all the interior lights and then turned on all our exterior lights in the yard. I just stood there shirtless in my pajama bottoms with a shotgun, occasionally walking up to the windows on either side of my house. The halo just kept circling. The spotlight kept darting back and forth quickly. I sat down in my chair and within a minute started to doze off again. This is when I saw a figure run by me on our sliding glass door from our backyard toward our side yard. I sat there in disbelief, waiting for it to happen again. When it didn't, I thought maybe I just caught some kind of shadow casted by that spotlight. But still, it didn't account for the footsteps that I definitely heard blowing by the back door. I kept my eyes open trying to remain as alert as possible. Sure enough, I see him run back by the opposite direction, checking the opposite perimeter of my house. I slowly stand up and watch him peek around the corner of my house and down the side yard. It was really impossible to deduce anything about him. He was standing in the dark with a hooded sweatshirt. He could have been maybe 15. He could have been 50. Either way, he was standing in my backyard when he definitely shouldn't have been. I watched as he silently crept back the way he went before, and then around the closer side of my house. This side was less illuminated and had access to the garage, and even the front yard via the gate. The other side yard was just a straight shot to a dead end wall, something similar to a dog run. This guy was definitely casing my house for the best possible route of escape, but he also seemed to be looking for something too. Maybe a weapon, or a vehicle, anything to improve the situation. I ran through my kitchen and realized my side door to my garage was open. I had a habit of always leaving that door unlocked because of the ease of access. Also, the hardware was a little finicky. Honestly, it needed replacing. I was just being lazy. Either way, that night, it almost cost me a heart attack or maybe even something worse. I unlocked the door to the garage and went in. I tried to lock the door to the side yard. He was already at the door turning the knob and pushing it though. The knob is tricky. Even when it's unlocked, the door itself was swollen from rain exposure and old framing. It's difficult to open. I racked the shotgun, pointed it at the door and yelled, Stop! Reached forward for that tactical flashlight that was mounted on the shotgun. And of course, my batteries were dead. <sighs> Maintain your weapons, folks. I recoiled back towards the water heater. I figured if he came through the door, I'd have to shoot him. There'd be no choice. If I didn't, he'd overpower me. The door behind me was unlocked. He'd have access to the house and a shotgun. So I just used that water heater as cover, as I realized I really didn't know anything about this person. He could potentially be armed. I realized then that I had to pull the trigger the moment that door opened up. If he had a gun and I hesitated, he could blast me first, get to my family that was sleeping upstairs. 
We all think we're going to be heroic and steadfast and resilient in those moments. And I probably would have stood my ground because I had my wife and son to protect. But the last thing that I wanted right then was to pull the trigger, hear the blast and have a man die violently in my house. What would my life be like after that? Would I have to get lawyers and lose my house, worry about retribution, have to look over my shoulder? Sometimes I'd lay awake at night, thinking about blunder that I said in conversation or a mistake that I made driving. Would I relive that moment I killed that guy over and over again while I was trying to fall asleep? The problem ended up solving itself though. The guy stood there, hand on the door but looking behind him as the cops rushed up to the side gate, flashlights and lots of yelling. 10 different commands all being screamed at the same time. They reached over and got the gate unlocked. The guy was on the ground. I put my shotgun down on the other side of the door. A female officer shined her light through the side door window and yelled, Sir, get inside. I went back into the kitchen and locked the door behind me. I then cracked a beer and took this long pole off a bottle of tequila. They arrested that guy. Then the helo carried off about an hour or so later. Then they were all gone, except for a few neighbors who were now awake. I went outside and locked the gate, went back to bed with a dry mouth and heart racing. My wife finally woke up, asked why I'd been sleeping. I'm fine, it's just insomnia. I didn't want to tell her then, not at 3 a.m. She'd freak out, and that was the last thing that I wanted. I called the next day to see if I could get any more details. The watch commander told me that the guy was a 16 year old kid from the neighborhood. Later I found out he ran away with my neighbor's kid, with no previous record, who had wealthy parents. He got caught breaking into a friend's house, took the cops on a chase, ditched his car a block away and then ran like hell. My yard was probably the darkest and most shaded, so he hid there. I never mentioned the shotgun or almost killing him less they know the better as far as I was concerned. The kid would be a man now in his early 30s. I've never seen him but the kids he ran with all definitely have kids of their own now and drive minivans and careers. Wherever he is, I hope he's doing better. He may or may not know that he was one door's threshold away from a violent and painful death. I want him to know but I don't want him to know now, you know?